podcast on us. Um, we're going to be dealing with the CTA level aspects. So you need to have a deep appreciation of those aspects. This, this is where um, if it's 15 gets complex. Uh, so let's move on to our objectives for this lecture. If you go to your part A, you know there's the main text and then you're going to have your appendices. You're going to have A and you're also going to have B parts in your part A. And if you go to the B, you're going to realize that um, we actually, on the first part of the B, we actually have all these lecture objectives with the paragraph references. So mark this so that if you get anything um, that is complex and if it's system related, you know where to find it. So um, at the end of this lecture, you should know how to account for the following items. So we've got a cell of right of cell with the right of return, we've got warranties, principal versus agent considerations, customer options for additional goods or services, customers' unexercised rights, non-refundable upfront fees, repurchase agreements, consignment arrangements, build and hold arrangements, and customer exemptions. So, like I said, please know where to find this in your part A standard, as it basically gives you the reference, um, the paragraph references of where to find this information. And those paragraph references also come with um, illustrative example references. So, if you know where to find this information in the test or exam, you will be covered and you will know how to deal with it because the standard is very um, um, useful in actually answering questions relating to this complex CTA areas. Okay, so let's get into the lecture. Okay, so we're going to start with the cell with the right of return. So what is the cell with the right of return? So basically we're saying that um, um, an entity has actually sold something and um, attached to the conditions and terms of that contract, they say, you know what, you can actually return um, this, you can actually return, you can actually return the goods that you've actually purchased and get your money back, all right? So the key thing, the key accounting issue, the key if it's 15 issue with the sale, the right of return is saying what amount can actually be recognized as revenue. So the issue is what amount are we expecting to actually be entitled to? So you need to take into account, you know, your past trends, the past trends of the entity and say, okay, fine. Uh, what is the normal um, percentage of return for goods or services that are actually received, right? So, um, for example, we've got uh, Mr. Price and Essay. I'm not sure about if it's in Zimbabwe. I'm not sure about if it's in Zimbabwe, uh, where you actually have the point of actually, um, you actually have, uh, they actually entitle you the right to actually re uh, return codes once you receive them. Right? So, do you think you should actually recognize the entire sales as your revenue when you actually sell your products? Or if you're expecting that some will be returned, you can't actually um, return, you, act, you can't actually record the, the entire sales as your revenue. So that's the key issue with your sales with the right of return. So the moment you know that some of the items that you sold are going to be returned, you actually can't recognize the entire amount as revenue because you know that some amounts are going to be returned. And if you go back to determining transaction price and whatnot, um, there's an issue, the standard actually highlights that if you expect that specific amounts are going to be returned, you can't actually recognize them as revenue. So we've gone through that. So now I want us to get to accounting for a sale with a right of return. So what accounts are actually going to be affected? So you've sold something, so it's obviously come out of your inventory, right? So your cost of sales and your inventory will obviously be affected. And then the fact that you've sold something, confirm there's the issue of sales and um, your, your bank amount and your sales. Um, so what journals would you effectively process to deal with this? 
Um, so I want to refer you to your para B20 and B27 in your part A of FS15. And in terms of journals that you'd actually process, so on the date of sale, um, confirm you've actually sold your inventory and all the amounts have actually gone out of your inventory. So all the amounts, all the inventory that you sold, you actually credit your inventory. But in terms of your cost of sales, you're expecting that maybe 20% will be returned. So you can't say that your cost of sales is 100% of the inventory that has gone out. It only has to be 80% and the balance is um, debited to an asset, which is a right to recover the product. Um, and then in terms of um, recognizing your revenue, you've actually received revenue for the 100% of the sales, or you have a trade receivables for the 100% of the sales, right? But then you can't recognize your revenue for the 100% since you expect maybe a 20% return. So your revenue is only up to the extent of 80%, and then the balance is a refund liability because you're saying that you are actually, um, your customers at actually expecting you to pay them back if they do return the products okay. so that's basically your journals in terms on the date of sale in relation to a sale with the right of return okay so now uh, i want us to then move on to a case where you're saying okay fine um the return period has lapsed right and then um you haven't no customers actually Turned anything. So it means that at this point you have no obligation to pay your customers because the return period has lapsed. So when you go to Mr. Price, maybe at least they say, okay, fine, you need to return it maybe within 21 days. After 21 days has, have passed, you can't then come and say, I expect to receive my money back. This therefore means that there's no longer a refund liability and you can process the 20% as your revenue right same goes to your cost of sales and uh, due recognition of the right to recover the product because you're saying that no returns can actually be received from now so now we're saying you know what i've actually um sold 100 percent of the product and i need to raise cost of sales in relation to that remember at the date of sale would only recognize cost of sales to the extent of 80 percent we're going to go through an example. This is a lot of talking, um, so don't worry. You'll get it once we get to the example. So, oh, here's our example. So an entity enters into a contract, into 100 contracts with customers. Each contract includes the sale of one project for 100, uh, let's say 100 Zim dollars. So the total consideration will be 100 products times $100 and you get a consideration of 10,000. So this is the amount of cash that will be received when um, you actually sell to your customer. So you uh, Edgar's and you sold 100 dresses to your customer. And then let's move on. We're told that the entity's customary business practices to allow a customer to return any unused products within 30 days and receive a full refund, right? So now, um, test your exam, you should now start getting warning signs and you're saying, okay, fine, we're actually expecting customers to return within 30 days. So any amounts that we're expecting to be returned within 30 days, we can't actually recognize as revenue because we know that they're going to be returned, right? Uh, we're given the cost of each product, which is 60. And why is the cost important? Remember, we're going to need to say, okay, fine, we sold products, we're de-recognizing our inventory and we're recognizing cost of sales. But will our cost of sales be to the extent of all the sales we made if we're expecting that some products will be returned? Okay, so let's move on with our example. Using the expected value method, the entity estimates that 97 products will not be returned, which means that uh, three products will be returned. So in recognizing our revenue, we need to recognize our revenue to the extent of 97 products. And in recognizing our cost of sales, it has to be the extent of 97 products. But how much cash have we received or how much inventory has gone out is the entire 100 products we've received cash for 100 products, which means your bank as well as your inventory will be to the extent of the 100 products. So I want you to pause this video, um, think about all the journals we we're talking about earlier and say, okay, fine, what journals would I have processed, all right? So I'd expect, let's go to our revenue. 
saying we're only going to say okay revenue for the 97 products so it's your 97 times the 100 but then in terms of your bank you received bank 400 products so you're going to say your 100 um, times the 100 to get the 10,000 so where is the difference falling we're saying that we actually have a refund liability if our customers come back and they say you know what I'm not happy with the product or I'm just returning the product we're just going to have to pay them back the 100 so we have a refund liability and in terms of cost of sales 100, 100 products have gone out right Okay, so in terms of our inventory, I mean, in terms of our inventory, 100 products have gone out. So we created our inventory with 100 times the 60. And then in terms of cost of sales, our cost of sales are in relation to the 97 products. We <laughs> reached there for me instead. Our cost of sales will be our 97 times the 60. Right, and what's the difference? Like I said earlier, we said that our difference relates to uh, an asset. We, the moment the customer returns, we're actually expecting to get our inventory back. So we've got some type of right of return asset in relation to the asset at its cost. So that's your sell with the right of return. Okay, so journals, I expect that you actually. You post the video and you actually came up with your different journals for the sale, so your revenue as well as like de recognizing your inventory, like I discussed. So mark yourself and say, okay, fine, have I understood this? If you haven't understood, I expect you to come for a consult. Please note that this example is actually from the B part of your standard, so no way to find it and just mark it if you think that you're going to struggle with it. But if you have understood it, there's no point of flagging your standard with things that you already know. I'd advise you in flagging your standard to make sure that you only flag things that you're struggling with and things that are essential. But because you said you so you go to your part A and you mark part B, which really refers you to the different. Um, paragraphs that deal with the specialized areas and you can you don't need to then flag them one by one because you've already flagged the b which will tell you go to b20 for sales with right of returns and then when you go to b20 you're also then going to get um illustrative examples that you then need to deal with okay so let's move on so we've covered ourselves with the right of return. Let's move on to a warranty. So a warranty basically describes the conditions under and period during which the producer or vendor will repair, replace, or compensate a defective item without cost to the buyer or the user. And often it also delineates the rights and obligations of both parties in case of claim or dispute. So usually when you go and buy um, cell phones, obviously not from Zimpost. Let's say you go to Samsung and you buy a cell phone, you could possibly um, get a warranty, right? So most of us know the warranty, which is basically an assurance that you know what the product is actually um, a fit for use as represented and it's free from defective material and workmanship and it meets statutory and other specifications. So basically we're saying it's functioning as intended. But if you go to your B28 and your B23, it's going to actually highlight the different types of warranties that you have. So we've got an assurance type and a service type. So you need to be able to make um, this distinction and uh, pick out the key issues. So key issues in relation to warranties is is the warranty a separate performance obligation? So in determining whether it's a separate performance obligation, you need to know what type of warranty it is and whether it was purchased separately or not, right? So with an assurance type, would you say that there's an additional good or service that um, the customer is actually getting? Not necessarily, you're just guaranteeing uh, that the good is the good is actually uh, working as intended, right? So the key issue actually comes uh, with the of warranties that are not assurance related. So I'd like to refer you to paragraph 22 and 28 to just see when you can say, okay, fine, this warranty is a separate performance obligation. It's explained splendidly in the standard. So. 
Let's go to this example. An entity or a manufacturer provides its customer with a warranty for the purchase of a product. The warranty provides assurance that the product complies with agreed upon specifications and will operate as promised from one year from the date of purchase. So is this like an assurance type warranty? Of course it is, right? So this is the general type of warranty and this wouldn't be a separate performance obligation. So go to your B28 to B33 look at the different types of warranties uh, so your main issue does not fall with assurance type because your assurance type are not um, separate performance obligations and are dealt with under IAS 37 you know provisions contingent assets and contingent liabilities so your issue comes with your um, service uh, type warranties okay so let's move on into our principal basis agent um, issues so it so happens do you know like when you're an entity you could sell your goods yourself or you could actually um, request other people to sell the goods on your behalf so um, a good a good example would be um, okay some supermarkets uh, they actually get some, they actually get stock from suppliers and uh, and they're selling on behalf of the suppliers. Can they say that's their revenue or what they're entitled to is the commission from selling the goods that they're selling, right? So it's important to differentiate between the two because if you're the principal, you're the seller and you recognize the revenue. But if you're the agent, you're basically facilitating the sale and what you recognize as your revenue is just the commission, not the actual sale of the entire product, right? So I'd like to refer you to part B34 to B38 and uh, there's a paragraph that talks to what are the indicators that an entity is an agent and therefore does not control goods or services. So who has the primary responsibility to fulfill the contract? The moment the principal is the one that needs, has the primary responsibility to fulfill the contract. The party, actually, let me say, has the primary responsibility to fulfill the contract is usually the principal. Also talk about who has inventory risk, who is responsible for establishing prices. The person establishing prices is most likely um, the person who is the principal and uh, is a consideration in the form of commission. Confirm is said the moment it's commission, you're an agent, you're just basically selling on behalf of someone and who is exposed to credit risk, all right? who really is exposed to credit risk. So you need to consider, to, to look at this different consideration to actually determine, are you the principal or are you the agent? Okay, so let's go through this example. Uh, there's an entity that operates a website that enables customers to purchase goods from a range of suppliers who deliver goods directly to the customers. So can you pick this out? There's a supplier who actually then um, displays their goods on this entity's website and the supplier basically needs to then deliver the goods displayed on the website to the customer. Under the terms of the entity's contract with suppliers, when good is purchased by the website, the entity is entitled to a commission. Can you see? The moment we're saying they're entitled to a commission, are they a principal or an agent? So they're probably an agent, right? And the entity's website facilitates payment between supplier and customers at prices are set by the supplier. Go back to our indicators that we're talking about. Can you see that we're actually taking off to say, okay, fine, no, this seems to be, um, the supplier seems to be the principal. The entity requires payment from customers before orders is process and all orders are non-refundable. The entity has no further obligations to the customer after arranging for products to be provided to the customer. So is the supplier in this case the principal or the agent or is the person, the entity operating the website, the principal or the agent? So I need you to answer those questions and I'm not going to answer this for you because I want you to go to your standard um go to the references go to the illustrative examples and you're going to find the answer there but i'm sure i've given you hints already so i need you guys to get into um, a habit of actually knowing how to use your standards to to actually make sure that in your tests and exams because you walk in with your standards you actually know how to use these Okay, so customer option for additional goods and services. So you walk in to pick and pay 
and um, these days they have this thing where they're saying that um, spend $25 you get a sticker and then you need to fill that um, sticker form with 25 and then you're gonna get uh, $25 right so with customer options for additional goods or services you're basically saying you're getting loyalty points for every um, purchase that you make and uh, these loyalty points will be towards satisfying a future uh, payment um, a future um, purchase of goods or services based on just the loyalty points not cash right so in dealing with power bit in dealing with your customer options for additional goods or services i'd like to refer you to your b39 and 43 they're very good examples there so the key issue is you're saying is um, is the loyalty point a separate performance obligation because there then comes an issue where you're saying i'm paying a um, hundred dollars today to pay to buy my groceries at pick and pay and then i'm going to get four stickers right those four stickers when they eventually add up to 25 you're going to actually get an additional 25 dollars to spend so when you're now identifying your performance obligation there's the goods and services now and there's also the uh, right to purchase for free future goods or services right so when you allocate and so the issue with customer option for additional goods or services comes at allocation of your transaction price so step what um hope you know uh, which step this is um so your customer options to acquire additional goods and services for free or at a discount come in many forms it could be sales incentives customer award credits customer renewal options or other discounts and good of you on future goods and services so i was focusing more on the loyalty points but it's basically the same so if they're separate performance obligations just make sure to actually allocate um, your transaction price to the goods purchased today and the future goods or services you're expecting because your 500 isn't entirely going to the goods or services you purchased today but it's also going to the ones today and the free ones you're going to get in the future okay so um an entity enters into a contract we're going through an example an entity enters into a contract for um sell of a product for 100 as part of the contract and uh, the entity gives the customer for 40 percent discount voucher for any future purchases up to 100 in the next 30 days the entity intends to offer 10 percent discount on all sales during the 30 days as part of a seasonal promotion the 10 percent discount cannot be used in addition to the 40 percent discount voucher so because all customers will serve a 10 percent discount to purchase during the next 30 days the only discount that provides the customer with the material right is the discount that is incremental to the 10 percent so that's the 30 additional percent discount the entity accounts for the promise to provide the incremental discount as a performance obligation in the contract for the sale of product a this agreement is an example in your standard just go through it and have appreciation so we also have an exercise right so you know uh, maybe you have a friend who has a birthday and you don't know what to get them in it gets and you just go and you buy a gift card right so the moment you buy a gift card your friend then needs to come through and exercise that gift card right but then um what happens is that a, con a contract may allow customers to pay now for goods or services to be delivered later when your friend then comes through and asks to actually utilize the value on their gift card. So the issue with customer ex unexercised rights is that sometimes customers never actually fully exercise the rights of the goods or services provided in the contract. So um, what, how then do you deal with um, um the rights that are not exercised this is actually considered dealt with as um, breakage so if you go to your power 106 upon receipt of prepayment from a customer the entity will recognize a contract liability in the amount of the prepayment for payment for its obligation to transfer and um, the entity also needs to recognize to recognize the contract liability and recognize revenue when it then transfers the goods or services and satisfies the performance obligation. So now the issue comes where um, the customer doesn't actually exercise, right? 
So you, should the unexercised rights be recorded as part of revenue, as part of revenue? So if an entity expects to be entitled to a breakage amount in a contract liability that is like a part of it is actually not exercised by the customer, the entity shall recognize the expected breakage, breakage amount as revenue in proportion to the pattern of rights exercised by the customer. So just go to your B44 and 47. So the main issue here is just saying, okay, you're going to have an exercise price. If you're actually expecting that um, the customer will not exercise, you can actually recognize as revenue, but only recognize as revenue in proportion to the pattern of rights exercised by the customer. Okay, so here's a mind map for you. So you're saying, does the entity recognize expect to be entitled to breakage if not you do not recognize breakage as revenue because you're saying that um, you're saying that you're expecting that the customer will exercise but um, if you don't think the customer will exercise you then need to recognize your revenue Okay, so we've got an issue of non-refundable upfront fees uh, where a customer pays in advance. So you need to determine whether the payment is relates to a specific promise of good or services or not, right? So I need you to follow through this mind map. So if it relates to a separate good or services, um, you need to actually identify if the upfront fee is related to a performance obligation and apply the balance of the five-step model accordingly. But if not, payment relates to an activity that does not transfer goods or services. We're basically saying that this forms part of your transaction price, all right? So this example, again, is a new standard. There's an entity that enters into a contract with the customer for one year of transaction processing services. The entity's contracts have standard terms that are same for all customers. The contract requires the customer to pay an upfront fee to set up the customer on the entity system. The fee is nominal and is non-refundable. And the customer can renew the contract each year without paying an additional fee. So now we need to now say, is this um, upfront payment in relation for a separate good or service? Um, so because the setup activities do not transfer goods or services to the customer and do not give rise to a separate performance obligation, we can say that, you know what, could this be forming part of your transaction price? Okay, so I want to move on to um, repurchase agreements, right? So you can sell something and also have a purchase, an option to repurchase, right? So with different forms of repurchase agreements, you can have an obligation to repurchase the asset as a forward contract or a right to. So the key issue is saying if you have an obligation, you definitely need to repurchase. So it's a forward contract. Or if you have a right to repurchase, which means that you can exercise the rights or not exercise it, this is a core option. Or you have an obligation to repurchase, but at the customer's request. So the customer is basically the one with the right to sell back to you. This is a put option. Um, so I need you to look at uh, these three examples. Just pause the video and look at them and start asking yourself, okay, is this, um, is this a forward, is this a call, is this a put? So if what is obliged to repurchase, the moment you say there's an obligation, we say that this transaction has, definitely has to follow through. So this is a forward contract. This is a, um, a, an agreement that says at this specific date, you actually need to repurchase. Right? And then if you have a right, we're saying this is a call option. But then if telecoms have the option to sell back to portraits, we're saying this is a put option. Your standard then gives you guidance on how to deal with the different items. Um, but then the main principle behind this uh, uh, repurchase agreements is if the customer does not obtain control of the asset, you should not recognize revenue uh, from contracts with customers. Um, so now there's an issue where you're saying, okay, fine, um, is this a lease or is this a financing arrangement? But this is not core in your syllabus. Just have a look at it and have an appreciation. So all of this put, call, 
forward is just at awareness level and you need to understand to just have an appreciation of it and then we also have consignment arrangements with your consignment arrangements you basically so what is consignment stock i'm sure you guys know consignment stock from audit all right so your b77 deals with your consignment arrangements so we've got indicators that uh, uh, the arrangement is a consignment arrangement so you need to go through that so example the product is controlled by the entity until a specified event case such as sell of a product to a customer the entity is able to require return of product so you you send um, your stock on consignment you can actually call it back and the dealer does not have an unconditional pay to obligation to pay for the content for the product you basically sent it to someone it's consignment stock if it doesn't get sold you don't actually need to pay for that product right so that's your consignment arrangements um, you also have bill and hold arrangements so where you're basically saying you build the customer that you're holding um, the inventory for them um, so the issue is can you actually recognize revenue so, so for you to say okay fine i've actually i can actually recognize the revenue um you you need to just say the customer has obtained control so even if you're holding you need to determine whether the customer has obtained control of the product so you could the customer could actually have control though you're holding if the reason for the pure and hold is substantive so the customer says okay i've paid for this but please just hold it for me and the product has actually been identified separately in your warehouse you know it's labeled you know what i bought this couch has been bought from tv and sales and your whole tv and sales is holding holding it in its inventory but it's actually labeled you know what this is hope's sofa and she's going to come and get it so no one else is going to get it and the product must can't be ready for physical transfer so you keep saying that it's actually being put together and if i come and i want my sofa i'm going to get it and then there's also the issue that the entity cannot have the ability to use the product or direct to another customer so it's basically the customer's product so that's a build and hold. I want you to go through this example, which is in your module, which basically says uh, the sale of machine and spare parts. Upon completion, the entity demonstrates the machine and spare parts with the agreed upon specification. Uh, and we have the distinct promise to transfer uh, the machine and spare parts. The customer pays for machine and spare parts, but only takes physical position but only takes physical position of the machine so we're still holding the spare parts but at this point you need to ask yourself okay fine are this spare parts does the entity actually control this spare parts can they come through and just dem demand them have i put them in a spe specific area in my warehouse and they're specifically labeled as the customer's spare parts um so if you go through the standard you're going to get this answer i want you to go look for it yourself so we're not going to go through it here and then the last um, thing we're going to do with this customer acceptance so does a customer necessarily need to accept an asset for you to say they have obtained control so if an entity can objectively determine the control of good services have been transferred to the customer with agreed upon specifications in the contract then customer acceptance is a formality, right? But if the customer cannot, if the entity cannot objectively determine that um, the product is within agreed upon specifications, they actually need to wait for the customer to say, you know what, I'm accepting this good or service. Okay, I hope this recording was helpful and uh, you have an appreciation of your complex areas. Uh, we didn't go through a lot of examples because i want you guys to go and look at your b part and go through your examples yourself and you have the appreciation okay thank you for your time if you have any questions feel free to contact the phoenix department